<laughs> okay, we're starting here. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I really want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I'm Keisha Rogers. For those who are here for the first time or watching for the first time, or, uh, don't know me. Uh, we are we have an extraordinary presentation tonight, uh, and we have been celebrating this week the life of a brilliant contribution to humanity, a great genius, and a pioneer of our American space program, but I have to say a pioneer of the world in terms of the exploration of space and his vision for space, Kraft Erica. And we are celebrating and have been celebrating this week Kraft Erica's 100th birthday. Kraft Erica was born on March 24th. Yesterday was his official birthday, uh, March 24th, 1917. And he died on December 11th, 1984. And Kraft Erica has been instrumental in the his contributions, not only to the space program, but to his vision for mankind. And the vision represented by his idea that there are no limits to mankind's growth, that the only limitations to the growth and progress of mankind are the limitations that man puts on himself. And today I'm joined by a colleague and friend of mine, Megan Beats, who is going to give a presentation on Kraft Erica and his contributions to space exploration but really how he has inspired our organization and what we have committed this organization to do to carry out that vision of Craft Erica, that we have to remove all limitations to growth and mankind's progress, that the Malthusian, Neo-Malthusian policy, that there are limited resources on the planet, there's limitations to mankind's growth, that that, that world no longer exists. That world could not ever continue to exist. And as we're seeing today, the world that has been put in place of a system of imperialism, of treating mankind as nothing more than beast, and to break this conception of the unity of mankind as one species, as one individual, that world is now being put out of existence and a new paradigm for mankind is now coming into existence. And uh, we see the effects of that. I, I won't go through details today because we are very short on time, but I want to just give you a, a picture of the moment where we find ourselves in. Because I think it's extraordinary after people, the world has, and the United States, the citizens of the United States, has been living under 16 years of dictatorship and destruction and lack of hope and optimism. You now find that there has been a shift in the global relationships throughout the world, a shift in the leadership of the United States. And this has been more emphat most emphatically with the recent developments of President, newly elected President Trump's statements as he has given a number of speeches in the last few days, which indicate a total shift into a new paradigm and that the United States is ready to break with what some would call the uh, American-British uh, relationships or special relations that we're forming new special relations. And those new special relations are organized around the conception of the American system of political economy. What China is doing right now and now finally moving toward the potential of taking up the win-win cooperation of China, uh, joining with other nations around the world to move toward a new conception of relationships uh, and of peace and progress and development for this nation and for mankind. And so over the course of the recent period, we've heard the president, if you haven't heard his speeches, uh, 
develop the concept of the American system, which has been very instrumental to the LaRouche organization, the policies of Alexander Hamilton, the policies of Lincoln, of specifically Henry Clay, the ideas of the foundations of the American system of our nation based on the principles of development, of building, referencing Lincoln's contributions to the transcontinental railway system, uh, referencing uh, President Dwight Eisenhower as the father of the interhighway system, uh, interstate highway system. And now, as one congressman said, you may be seeing President Trump <coughs> be known for future generations as the president of the interplanetary uh, system. So, <laughs> inter so what I wanted to start off with, uh, because we're short on time here, is I'd like to first of all show a five minute uh, clip of President Trump in his speech that he gave today on our restoring a commitment to space exploration and discovery. And I think you will be quite mm -hmm. moved and inspired by this. So why don't we show that first? Fellow Americans, this week, in the company of astronauts, I was honored to sign the NASA Transition Authorization Act right into law. With this legislation, we renew our national commitment to NASA's mission of exploration and discovery. And we continue a tradition that is as old as mankind. We look to the heavens with wonder and curiosity. More than two decades ago, one scientist followed this curiosity and dramatically changed our understanding of the universe. The year was 1995. Taxpayers were spending billions and billions of dollars on NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. The astronomer in charge had a novel idea. He wanted to use the expensive telescope in a totally unconventional way. Instead of pointing Hubble's eye, at nearby stars or distant formations, Robert Williams wanted to peer into the void. He aimed the massive telescope at one of the emptiest regions of the night sky. For 10 days during Christmas of 1995, Hubble stared into the abyss, seeking whatever light it could glean from the darkness, and it was total darkness. Fellow astronomers didn't know if he'd see much of anything. But Williams was rewarded, and the entire world was struck by the awesome images of our satellite return. In that tiny patch of sky, the Hubble deep field showed thousands of lights. Each brilliant spot represented not a single star, but an entire galaxy. The discovery was absolutely incredible. But the unforgettable image did not satisfy our deep hunger for knowledge. It increased ever more and even more, and reminded us how much we do not know about space, frankly, how much we do not know about life. With this week's NASA reauthorization, we continue progress on Hubble's successor, the James Webb Space Telescope. It is amazing. The Webb Telescope is set to launch next year. It will gaze back through time and space to the very first stars and the earliest galaxies in the universe. We can only imagine what incredible visions it will bring. At a time when Washington is consumed with the daily debates of our nation, 
I was proud that Congress came together overwhelmingly to reaffirm our nation's commitment to expanding the frontiers of knowledge. NASA's greatest discoveries teach us many, many things. One lesson is the need to view old questions with fresh eyes, to have the courage to look for answers in places we have never looked before, to think in new ways because we have new information. Most of all, new discoveries remind us that in America, anything is possible if we have the courage and wisdom to learn. In the span of one lifetime, our nation went from black and white pictures of the first airplane, the beautiful images of the oldest galaxy, captured by a camera in outer space. I am confident that if Americans can achieve these things, there is no problem we cannot solve. There is no challenge we cannot meet. There is no aim that is too high. Whatever it takes and however long it will be, we are a nation of problem solvers and the future belongs to us. We are truly a great place to be. I love America. I introduced Megan, I just wanted to uh, let people know that we are, as we're having this meeting here today, we are also celebrating the life and contributions of Kraft Erika in a conference in Munich in Germany. Uh, the title of the conference is On the Centennial of the German-American Space Pioneer, Realizing Kraft Erika's Vision for the Future of Mankind. And we'll have more reports on, on that extraordinary conference. And I just wanted to end with a contribution to Craft Erica, just a, a very short excerpt from a conference that we held in, in June of 1985. Uh, and this was a memorial conference to the life of Craft Erica. And it was titled, the proceedings of the conference was co titled Colonized Space, Open the Age of Reason. And Mr. Lyndon LaRouche's contributions to that conference uh, were titled, Erica's Contribution to Global and Interplanetary Civilization. And he writes, as each of us is born, each of us must die. Within that brief interval of life, what distinguishes a life as human, as exalted above the conditions of mere beasts? is that which the individual contributes to the enduring benefit of future generations. Our beloved and most accomplished friend, Kraft Erica, has bequeathed to future generations a beautiful and most valuable gift. I think that's very appropriate for our celebration of the birth and life of Kraft Erica and enjoy Megan. So, thank you. Hi, can you all hear me? Well, I'm going to assume you can hear me until, unless Mike sends me a message. Um, so thank you very much for having me today. I'm, I'm very excited to, to speak to you, even if for a short time. And uh, I want to begin, actually, if we could pull up the first slide while I read something. I'd like to begin by reading something that Croft Erica wrote in 1948. So think about that, 1948, that was just after the end of World War II. Croft Erica had been in the United States for two years and he was just beginning to master English. And um, this was still a full nine years before the first satellite would be launched into orbit. So what I'm gonna read you is the opening of something he wrote called Expedition Ares. And, um, so that he, he's writing this in 1948, and this is an imaginary account of space travel in the year 2050, as seen 
by people 400 years in the future. So he says, we live in an age of fast flying, far reaching spaceships and are proud of what human ingenuity has achieved. Research is going on with ultra fast ships reaching half of the velocity of light and designed as powerful instruments for visiting our neighboring stars. But the adult soon forgets the first stumbling steps of the child and the first attempts to reach our nearest cosmic vicinity have almost completely vanished from our memory. Looking back through the centuries, we perceive a chain of heroic deeds which mark man's grasp at other planets. Only 50 years ago, Glenn Wolfe's party landed on Pluto. Their flashlight photographs show the men wading through helium pools amidst fantastic structures of frozen gas, which tower into the eternal night. These pictures belong to the standard equipment of astronomical books today. 100 years ago, Ted Aitken, the most fearless space explorer of his time, died in a bold attempt to reach Saturn. His ship, the famous Nightmare, was smashed between the rocks of Saturn's ring after a meteor had blown away the navigation room. A hundred years before his time, Gordon Rockwell opened the golden age of discoveries. He was the first to jump into his ion-powered blizzard over the Great Gulf, the vast gap behind Mars, as they called it, and intrude into the dangerous realm of Jupiter's satellites. This pioneer discovered fossils of a strange life on satellite number 111. It blossomed millions of years ago when the giant planet was still a hot, animating center of its extensive system. Gordon Rockwell actually founded the cosmic branch of paleobiologic bio sciences and made Jupiter's moons an El Dorado of cosmic life research. Even farther back, Old documents reveal the tragedies connected with the exploration of Venus, and they tell a tale of Duke Hatchward's sunny trip to Mercury. Yes, planet after planet unveiled their secrets before the eager spirit and ironclad will of keen explorers. Yet, there is one planet which must be mentioned separately. Mars, the most familiar outer world for our generation, is connected with the very beginnings of space travel. Back in the 20th century, when tiny rockets climbed a meager 200 miles, did you ever hear of a V2? Mars was the dream goal of those who believed in space travel. Actually, a fantastic conception when one considers the troubled and primitive world into which they were born, Mars was considered the most interesting planet in the system, the only one that might bear life. Some even dreamed of a Martian civilization superior to ours with which a cosmic exchange of ideas might be brought about. Small wonder that Mars became the first planet ever explored by man. Circling the Earth in small scout rockets, scientists and engineers, dreamers and adventurers found themselves on the brink of a vast emptiness, beyond which new worlds lured and stimulated their desire to remove the barriers erected before man and star. The first attempt to realize these dreams is known in history as Expedition Ares. So that's Kraft's introduction, and he goes on to depict this first attempted mission to land on Mars. Now, 
what an incredible and important imagination he had. And I wanted to ask you, all of you today sitting in that room, to take a moment and think of ourselves from our standpoint now in 2017. Imagine what mankind in 100 years might be like. And imagine not what we will perceive mankind 100 years to be, but imagine what people in 500 years will look back on those people and what will they think of them? How will they perceive their actions? Now, when you think of these people 100 years from now, can you imagine a humanity for whom war is something which is unknown? In other words, war is something which children of that time learn about in history books when they study a more primitive age of man, but it's not something which exists in civilization. Now I want you to imagine how those people will look back on 2017. What will be the meaning of China's one belt, one road to them? Maybe um, when these people look back on 2017, they will recall or recall having read about the first year that humanity finally began to integrate itself with the world land bridge and began to become a modern civilization. Perhaps they'll look back on 2017 and see a population which finally took the steps to shut down a ridiculous Wall Street economic system, to put Wall Street out of existence and shut down this gambling and looting system. And instead, they replaced it with the American system. And maybe they'll look back on 2017 as the very beginning of actions that were taken which eliminated poverty for good which eliminated famine, such that it was no longer known among mankind. Now, I want you to think about ourselves from their standpoint. And now look back at them. Perhaps the year 2117 will be the first year that mankind begins to settle Titan the moon of Saturn. Or perhaps we'll be far beyond that by that point. Perhaps we'll be exploring some of the, the middle to outer reaches of our solar system. Now that play in your imagination, that possibility, that should be everyone's understanding of what we today could cause the meaning of the Trump administration in the United States to be. Now, I think that video gives us a sense that the Trump administration might be a little bit more aware of this possibility than we thought. But no matter how aware of it or not, it, it doesn't really matter. We have to think today about our own responsibility for realizing this great potential that I asked you to play with in your imagination. And the way that we do that, the way that we understand our task today to determine the meaning of the Trump administration is to begin by passing LaRouche's four laws to save the USA, which will allow us to reestablish the American system, first by putting Glass-Steagall in place to put Wall Street out of its misery, and to put the measures in place to enable the activity that LaRouche calls for in his fourth law, which is for a fusion driver, science driver crash program, which includes the space program. So for that space program today, Kraft Erika is the absolute touchstone. He is the absolute model for what a successful and meaningful space program among mankind must be. Now, 
Croft Erica, as you saw in the slide and Keisha mentioned, was born 100 years ago in 1917. And he was there from the very beginning of the space age. And, and actually he was born only a few years after mankind first achieved flight. Um, and he, re he recalled that as a young man, he was completely gripped by the idea that mankind could leave the earth and open up a new world beyond the earth bring civilization to, um, to take up residency in a completely new world, which was separate from the earth. This idea fascinated him. So in other words, not the idea of just extending terrestrial mankind and extending all of his qualities to a different place, but transforming mankind by opening up a completely new world. And he said that it really could only be compared to the event um, many millions of years ago when life first emerged from the oceans onto land. So think about, take a minute and think about what a profound transformation that was for life on Earth. The emergence from the ocean to put life on land for the first time and what that opened up. It opened up the possibility of warm bloodedness. It opened up the possibility of what eventually became the higher life forms that could then support cognition. So it's that significant of a change that Kraft Erika was uh, thinking about and taking upon himself the responsibility for taking those first steps. So, that uh, idea of what a space program is really about, that's much more advanced than almost all of Croft Erica's contemporaries. And it's certainly much more advanced than people today who have generally become somewhat demoralized, somewhat practical, um, have become, have, have submitted to the idea that we can only do small things. Um, but Kraft was different. He was not looking for, you know, big victories in a space race against our enemy. He was not looking for, he was not even looking for simple exploration where we send people millions and millions of miles away to plant a flag somewhere and then come back and check it off of our list. Um, he was not thinking of anything practical except to the extent that it served this mission of mankind's extraterrestrial imperative. And that mission of the extraterrestrial imperative, Croft Erica saw as a fundamental transformation of mankind. And I think you could compare that difference in thinking, if you, th you know, think back to the European settlers that first crossed the Atlantic Ocean and came to America. And the majority of those people came here for either reason reasons of adventure, seeking a fortune, or escaping something. But when it came down to it, most of those people who came here came, in their own minds at least, for a somewhat practical reason. But there was a minority that understood that the possibility of setting up a republic on the shores of America would completely alter human history. And that's how Croft Erica thought about the space program. Now, um, what Croft did, he had um, a shorter life than he should have, but what he dedicated that life to, and what he worked on, especially in the last decade of his life, is how we would move every aspect of civilization off of the earth and how that would open up completely new possibilities for mankind and how it would unveil new potentialities of places like the moon, for example. And Croft spent, worked tirelessly to imagine what many of those new possibilities might be. Um, and what he said, he, what he said in a paper he wrote in, I think it was 
1959 or something to that effect, um, he said, we have to begin by occupying uh, low Earth orbit. We have to begin by putting a space station up into orbit. And uh, he said we could do that by the 1960s. Now, as, as people know, we didn't have, uh, you know, we had Space Lab in the 1970s, I think it was, and the Mir space station, we didn't get the full-fledged International Space Station until the 1990s. And, um, but Kraft said we can have a space station by the 1960s. And he imagined this would be the first baby step that would be the training grounds for human beings to train living and operating in space to train and learn more about um, man's biology and medical conditions, to uh, do experimentations with how chemistry behaves in the space environment, how different materials behave in the space environment. Um, he also imagined things that could be established like hospitals established in orbit or retirement homes established in orbit. And I thought that was actually really beautiful because he was thinking about, well, okay, in orbit, you have a completely unique environment of zero G. And what benefits could zero G bring to people who are recovering from injuries or people who have, who are elderly and we could relieve the stress on their joints by moving them to a lower gravity environment. He also imagined that we would begin to set up manufacturing facilities in zero gravity and take advantage of the unique environment and what that might allow us to build in terms of um, structures of metal that with a much, um, with a much uh, higher purity and a much more, um, I'm losing my words here, but, but um, to, to manufacture metals and so forth that are much stronger than what we can manufacture on Earth. And he also imagined space stations that would um, be a resort where people could go there on vacation and experience a completely new environment, including what he imagined as zero gravity swimming pools where you could swim around as if in water. So he imagined conquering low earth orbit and then moving beyond very quickly moving beyond to absorb all of cis lunar space or the space that includes the earth all the way up to the moon and their orbits to absorb that into human civilization. Now, how did he think about that? I wanted to give one example from our pamphlet. If we pull up the next slide. So this is an image in the, our new, the newest LPAC pamphlet about the four laws and joining the Silk Road. And it gives an example of how space-time was changed with the building of rail in the United States. So on the left, you see rail, um, you, you, on the left, what you see indicated by the different colors is how many days of travel it would take from New York City to get to any of the other areas in the United States. So you look at the transformation between 1830 and 1857 because of the building of rail. Space and time became condensed. And this transformed everything, not just passenger, um, you know, the ability for you personally to travel somewhere, but it also completely changed the economic possibilities of moving freight moving semi-finished products, moving raw materials to different industrial centers. Now, Croft imagined such a thing for cis lunar space. And as part of his work, he thought of a, the design of a multi-layered transportation system that would um, incorporate different segments of the Earth to the moon. And uh, he called this, or at least some components of this, he called this the Diana fleet. And he imagined, um, so you think about what are the different components of getting, of, of transportation between the Earth's surface and the Moon's surface. Well, you have to get from, from the surface of the Earth up into low Earth orbit. And 
I actually haven't seen Croft talk very much. The way that we do that today is with very large rockets, um, like the, Apollo, the, the Saturn V rocket or the one that NASA is building today, the, the SLS rocket. Um, Mike Carr has just done a lot of work looking into more modern proposals for that, which he can tell you about. I've not seen Croft talk very much about that. But what he does talk about is the different ways of getting from low Earth orbit to lunar orbit, both for people and freight, and then getting from lunar orbit to the surface. And so um, if we pull up the next slide, here's something he designed, which is a nuclear-powered cargo ship. And he imagined that, that at a certain point in our um, process of developing the economic activity on the moon, that you would have a very large um, fleet of these nuclear-powered cargo ships that can move uh, partially finished structures, that can move raw materials like hydrogen and other things that would be imported from the Earth and transport things back and forth from the moon. He also imagined um, some very novel ways of getting from the lunar orbit to the lunar surface. And here is one of them that he designed himself, which is called the Lunar Slide Lander, which would um, descend from orbit. And it, the way that it would slow down is by sliding along the uh, sandy, gravelly surface of the moon and transferring the momentum of the ship to the momentum of this lunar soil. And he said in that way, you could eliminate by 90% the amount of propellant that you would need. Um, he also, and he also imagined getting back up from the surface of the moon, back up to lunar orbit. He designed something which is a, it's basically a maglev launch system where he imagined um, a, a partially enclosed launch tube with a vehicle that would be propelled by electro, partially by electromagnets, partially by propellants. Um, so, right, to skip over a lot, but, you know, Kraft really was thinking about how do we integrate this new unique environment into civilization and how can we use this, um, how can we use mankind leaving the earth and going out into the solar system as a driver to develop new capabilities, new technologies. And uh, what he, something he saw clearly is that for cislunar space, um, nuclear ion propulsion, which is something we already have today, um, and chemical propulsion are completely adequate. But if we want to go farther, if we want to start from the moon, and go to Mars or go to the moons of Jupiter, the kinds of things he described in that story that I read at the beginning of, we have, we have to move quickly to nuclear powered rockets. And um, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. So he imagined things like uh, an integrated transportation fleet that would completely change the space time of getting both people and um, cargo between the Earth and the Moon, right? And 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 f fill that empty space. What most people think of as a completely empty space between the Earth and the Moon, actually fill this, integrate it into part of man's infrastructure. Now, the other thing, another thing he thought of are the unique kinds of products that could be manufactured on the Moon. And I said this in a, in the Wednesday show, but you know, I, I hadn't really considered what kinds of things you might manufacture on the moon. I had, I guess I'd always thought of the moon as this, you know, desolate frontier and we would just manufacture the, the bare necessities for people to, to live there. Maybe we would make some, you know, ugly gray bricks to build some houses or something. But Croft had a completely different idea as opposed to my kind of silly idea. but. You know, he said, look, with the resources on the moon and with uh, the establishment of a central processing manufacturing center on the moon, you could produce an incredible uh, array of products. And I'm just going to read some of them. 
So he said on the moon you could produce products such as sheet metal, trusses of aluminum, titanium, and magnesium, castings, bars, wires, glass, glass wool, ceramics, powdered ceramics, insulation, silicon chips, solar panels. Um, you could also produce entire structures of various metals that would be needed for, you know, maybe to enlarge the, the lunar space station or to build fusion power plants on the, the moon's surface. You can manufacture and build all of these things on the moon. You could also manufacture water. You could manufacture um, liquid oxygen, which would be needed for chemical propellant. And the other thing he talked about manufacturing on the moon is helium-3. Now we know today that you don't need to manufacture helium-3 on the moon. You can just mine it. And, um, and the reason you want helium-3 is because it's the ideal fuel for fusion power. And this is the other product that he saw as being not, a, not as much a product so much as an outcome of establishing civilization on the moon was fusion power. Fusion power plants are actually easier to establish on the moon than they are on Earth. Not only are they easier to build because of the vacuum, because of the cold temperatures that are needed for, for superconducting magnets, but fusion power is also necessary for lunar civilization, right? You cannot power lunar civilization with solar panels. Right? Aside from the low power density, the moon is dark for two weeks out of the month. So you need fusion power to underwrite lunar civilization. So fusion power is another, and I thought that was fascinating, right? Here we've been trying to achieve fusion power on Earth you know, really since the 1940s and 50s. But fusion might actually be, you know, belong to civilization on the moon, so to speak. Um, so just in the interest of time, um, oh, we can pull up the slide, the next slide here. I'm not going to talk about this for time reasons, but he also imagined and designed a way to use um, nuclear explosions to um, mine and refine raw materials. But I wanted to end with um, I wanted to end with this thought from Lyndon LaRouche and then open it up for, for about 15 or so minutes of discussion, questions and thoughts. But I want to end with this thought of Lyndon LaRouche, which I think is very important. And, and when I, while we're reading this, I want you to think back to what I opened with in terms of imagining mankind 100 years from now and what the meaning of 2017 actually is from their standpoint. So Linda LaRouche said, all mankind has a commitment, an innate commitment to create knowledge of the future. All mankind must subdue their passions to conform to what the future of mankind represents. The point is the understanding of the individual to reach and achieve the ability of insight into what the future species must do. The improvement of the human species, lifting the human species out of its ordinary existence, taking it out of its mediocrities. So I'll end there and we have a few minutes for questions or thoughts. Go ahead. Okay, so who has a question, comment? Go ahead, Joe. I, I read your article in the uh, latest EIR along with partial grievance, and it was like a, a movement of a war chat with Erica's article at the beginning is the, is the first movement, mm -hmm. but uh, I think recommend a, a fourth movement if, if you could interview both Helga and Marshall Freeman on their direct collaboration.
conviction with the Grand Jury member. That's how his, his vision was revived by his interaction with the human energy foundation and the cure. So, uh, I'm sure something like an interview would be a way to flesh out his collaboration with us. Could you? Yeah, good idea. <laughs> yeah, I think that's an excellent idea. I think we'll probably get some good raw material that could be shaped into an interview from the conference, the Schiller conference this weekend, where both Helga and Marsha are there speaking. So I think that's an excellent idea. <laughs> I think people are enjoying that great image of uh, provoking the imagination as you did, Megan. So they're still living in that future world right now. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, this Trump video that you started with, I mean, I think further thoughts or ideas. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. No. Well, yeah. I just, you too. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say quickly to maybe provoke people, although this question is this Trump video that you showed at the opening there. I mean, this is, this is history moving forward. You know, this is, it's a, it's just a really, um, we haven't heard ideas like this in a long time, and I think it should. We should integrate that into what we know as the much longer-term fight and the much higher principle of Craft Erica, and think about what that Trump speech could be made to mean in that context. Yeah, and I think this question of, as you posed, it's about we what our responsibility is, what we see our responsibility to realizing the future we want to bring into existence. I mean, everyone's always talking about John F. Kennedy's speech, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your, your country, for your nation. And that's, you know, very applicable to, to today is not just wait and see, oh, is the president gonna make another good speech? And, you know, as a spectator, but really, we're out to uh, create a presidency that will make this nation and the world proud, great again, uh, and respect the, that the world respect the United States again. But you know, not just in a way respect the United States as we are the authority and we're going to tell you what to do, but that we're going to collaborate in the interest of all mankind and each other. So, um, yeah, I think. I'm sorry, say it again. We need education to be back in place for the kids. We need education back in place. It's far behind right now. It's, it's, a, it's that's, not going to have to have the education back there. That's absolutely true. You have something? Did you hear that, Megan? I just heard education. He said we have to put it a real education program back in place because it's not going to happen if the education is not there. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And it, I mean, that, you know, there's been all this talk of STEM, STEM education over the past years and, and so forth. I mean, fine. Yes. We want people studying technology and engineering. Yes. But, you know, it's, you don't have to go through all that hullabaloo if you actually have a space program again, right. you know? People are going to be hungry for that. Children are naturally incredibly excited about doing great and, and you know, great things which have never been accomplished before. So, no, you're absolutely right. And, and it goes hand in hand with launching these great programs. Right. Let me uh, take Mark here. Oh. Uh, we considered the implications of the uh, either the expiration or revocation of the uh, atmospheric test ban treaty and, uh, and uh, nuclear-powered spacecraft uh, launched from the surface of the planet. Yeah, so um, 
two things. I mean, I haven't thought through it in depth, but I, I, I will say two things on it. One is that um, um, <laughs> Edward Teller, who people might have heard of, he was a acquaintance of LaRouche, friends. He was um, a science advisor to President Reagan. He ran the nuclear fusion program, worked on, anyway, Manhattan Project. He um, he actually thought that that was terrible, you know, we should lift this ban, that it's terrible, that we should do nuclear, all sorts of nuclear testing and in space, it's a great way, to, great place to do it. He also thought that we should you know, use nuclear bombs to, to for construction and all sorts of things. So, but, but also, you know, in terms of nuclear rockets and so forth, I mean, Croft made the point that nuclear rockets in no way uh, violate that. I mean, I forget the exact, what the exact terms are, but he actually thought, you know, thought about that and said, yeah, nuclear rockets in no way violate this, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was just going to say that um, Aspen Lee uh, spoke at the uh, Houston Museum of Natural Science uh, this past week, and um, he was asked by Scholastics to write a, a children's book on Mars, which he did. And... Um, and he was saying, and, and he was just lowballing it, but he said that for us to to move to Mars, uh, it's going to cost uh, about four hundred billion dollars, and that the um, uh, the recent budget for NASA, you know, that's you know that's just a a little milestone. We're just going to be a lot, it's going to be a need for a lot more investment in the space program. That's less than what we spent in Afghanistan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, that's what he said too. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead. I just, I, I just think it's important to emphasize that with Trump talking about the American system, I don't think that would be current if we hadn't put out the political economy of the American system back in about 1985 and had been fighting and putting, promoting those ideas for the last 30, 40 years. That, that these ideas are in the political system because of Lynn. They wouldn't be. They would have been buried. And it's important for us to get people to understand that the role that Lynn has played is to put these ideas into circulation so that well-meaning patriots can actually have access to these ideas. Otherwise, they wouldn't have it. It was 1976 when the political economy of the American Revolution was published. Yeah, it was 76, okay. Mm -hmm. We need some, his, some historians to the memory of historians who have passed on from the LaRouche organization, uh, have passed away now. Uh, we have to give them some presidential medals of honor in their memory. Uh, Graham and Salisbury and few other people we can name so but we're carrying out that that memory of those individuals by making this American system as you said a part of our being a part of our existence not just look talking about a history that happened in the past or something that was oh we're reflecting on past moments of days of old days of good but that this is what the United States has to return to right now. So, Megan, I, I know you have um, an, another appointment, and thank you for being with us. If there was um, anything else you want to add or uh, end with, go ahead. And otherwise, have fun today. Yeah, no, not no new ideas. I just think people should just read Croft Erica, watch his lectures. Just we have to make this guy alive right now and and there's just an unending wealth of of resources there so I'll just leave it there good and i would say read lyndon larouche's four laws as megan said and not only read it make sure this is circulated throughout the population because we have a responsibility to educate he's right the education system has gone downhill and most people don't even know what the principle of the American system of political economy is. So uh, we'll let in with that for today.